ことは知らない俺たちがさせない生きろどんどん In today's day and age, any monkey can reboot a franchise and claim it'll be fresh and new. It's very rare when a reboot turns out to be actually good. Ryuta Tasaki's Gamera the Brave is one of those rare exceptions. Often overlooked and given very little attention, Gamera the Brave reinvigorates old tropes and succeeds where Toho's rebirth of Mothra trilogy failed. The plot has a Spielberg quality to it due to the fact that the film is about a boy and his turtle, and just like a Steven Spielberg film, it's mostly character driven, but I'll get into that in a moment. Unlike Godzilla King of the Monsters, Gamera the Brave deals with its family tragedy and healing process by giving time and attention to character development. Despite the subject matter, Tasaki never brings weird logic to explain the kaiju or forces audiences to take it or leave it. Instead, he lets any logic flow naturally like a documentary without condescending to the audience's intelligence. In past Gamera films, the value behind human characters was to get audiences from point A to point B. However, Gamera the Brave lingers on its characters to show why we should care about them. The film returns the franchise to having children assume the leading roles. While the children of the Showa films tended to be cringy and annoying, the children of Gamera the Brave are surprisingly tolerable and heartwarming. Ryo Tomioka delivers a performance that is emotional and surprising, considering he was only 12 when he starred in this film. Tomioka brings pain, humor, and nuance to Toru, as well as hope in the form of Toto. When that hope is threatened to be taken away, just like his mother was, we genuinely feel for Toru, and to an extent, Toto. Tasaki never rushes their relationship. He nurtures it by dedicating enough time, hijinks, and drama for the relationship to properly blossom. Tasaki doesn't linger on Toru's father long enough, and we hardly ever see how he copes with his wife's death. However, Kanji Suda delivers an effective enough performance and is a better parental figure than the awful parents from the Showa films. Jim! Oh, Jim! Jim! Oh, Jim! Oh, damn. Mai is given little screen time, but surprisingly, she's given enough material to deliver a standout performance that makes us care and feel for her throughout the entire film. The weakest human characters are the stereotypical greedy politicians and scientists. They get no development whatsoever, much less a character arc. They just seem like obligatory cannon fodder. Zetus is a charming monster, but there's nothing special about him. He's treated more like a giant animal looking for food rather than a strange beast whose origins defies logic. His origins are never explored. He just shows up out of the blue. While not a character, there is a monster committee that seems to be referenced many times. I wish the film could have expanded more on this group to shed some light on this reboot's universe, because it seems like the government goes out of their way to help Toto rather than kill him. So there was clearly an alliance formed in the past, and I kind of want to see how that came to be. The monster that truly shines in this film is Toto. The monster never speaks, but we grow attached to him through his hijinks and subtle expressions. What I find weird about Toto is that he doesn't have the traditional Gamera roar, and neither does the adult Gamera. Instead of having a brand new roar, both Gameras are given a recycled roar from the 1957 film The Land Unknown. The special effects are relatively solid. Thanks to the monsters being smaller than usual, most of the miniatures are given lifelike detail. Even some of the green screen compositing looks exceptional. My main issue with the effects is the Zeta suit. It's so obvious that it's a man in a suit. This was likely done for more mobility, but it sacrifices a level of realism and consistency. I say realism because there are times when Toto looks realistic in design and execution, but Zetus is never given that same treatment. And I say consistency because there are many times when the head looks bigger than the body. The movie clearly demands that you take Zetus seriously as a villain, but these flaws make him come off more as hysterical and cheesy. Yoko Ueno delivers a score that is captivating and fresh. While her music is not on the same level as Ko Otani's Gamera music, she delivers a soundtrack that is unique to this film and its version of Gamera. 
Ueno's music is the heart and soul of the movie. She captures the film's emotional nature and its monsters with the right sound at the right moments. The pacing is surprisingly exceptional. The movie never drags and never feels rushed. It's perfectly balanced. This is likely thanks to director Ryuta Tasaki and his directing skills. He knows what does and doesn't benefit the story and characters, and as a result, we get a well-balanced feature film that tells its story properly with the right tone and pacing. Overall, Gamera the Brave is a severely underrated film. It's packed with enough emotional and relatable drama, character development, and kaiju mayhem to appeal to masses and the average kaiju fan. Ryuta Tasaki and his team delivered a solid, well-made monster movie that proves that a good Gamera movie can still be done with children leading the film, and I would argue that it's amongst one of the best installments in the franchise. Unfortunately, the movie flopped in Japan, a shame because many people missed out on a good movie, but to this day, there has been no Gamera film produced since Gamera the Brave was released in April 2006, which is somewhat poignant yet poetic considering that the final line of the movie is Toru saying goodbye Gamera. Maybe the filmmakers knew this was the end, and chose to lay Gamera to rest with a swan song that honored the past and embraced the present. Despite its box office performance, they made a really good film in the end, and Gamera's father, Noriaki Yuasa, would have been proud of this film. I award Gamera the Brave 3 stars out of 4.